If you have a poor understanding of how your metabolism works, pursuing weight loss can be an incredibly frustrating thing. You could either be doing way too much or not doing enough of the right things. Usually it's a mix of both. So for the sake of this conversation, we have to talk about your metabolism as not just one collective metabolism, but a multifaceted one, particularly two metabolisms. most common assumption is that you have one metabolism. Your metabolism is either high and fast or low and slow. This isn't really particularly how it works, right? Especially when it comes to something like weight loss. You have two different metabolisms. You have your glucose metabolism and your fat metabolism. Now these two run parallel to each other, but they deviate, right, at a point. So when you're blood sugar levels or your blood glucose levels are elevated fat metabolism is going to be suppressed right because glucose metabolism is going to be the primary driver of your energy system when blood sugar declines fat metabolism picks up right and so they change gears right so they work in coordination with each other and they're parallel but they do deviate under those circumstances now, people who struggle with weight loss, they usually have a hitch in either both of these or one of them. Some people have a really good glucose metabolism where they're insulin sensitive. And then some people have a very poor glucose metabolism where they're insulin resistant as opposed to being insulin sensitive. Then on the other side, they can have a really good fat metabolism where their adrenal glands are working the way they're supposed to, or they have adrenal fatigue and they have a poor fat metabolism, right? And so you can either have a poor glucose metabolism where you're insulin resistant and you got adrenal fatigue and that's keeping you from losing weight, or you can have, uh, you can be really insulin sensitive, but a poor fat metabolism or poor, really good fat metabolism and insulin resistant, right? So it can be these switches. Now, most people who are struggling to lose weight are actually insulin resistant to some degree or another, right? And so the simple thing really is to reduce the lipotoxicity in this case, which means you got to bring down your saturated fat intake as much as possible, right? So you should have a carbohydrate dominant diet to train your body to be more insulin sensitive, right? When people are insulin resistant, they think, oh, well, since my body struggles uh, to use carbohydrates for energy, well, I should just cut my carbohydrates and just rely on my fat metabolism, right? Now, this could be a very bad idea, especially if you also have a poor fat metabolism. So for example, if you do a keto diet or a carnivore diet and you don't lose any weight, Right? If that's the case, that just means that you may be insulin resistant and have a poor fat metabolism. Some people, they do a keto or a carnivore diet and it's very effective for them. They cut all their carbohydrates and then weight starts moving on the scale and they lose weight. Right? But the problem is, is that if you never fix your insulin uh, sensitivity levels, then you, you'll forever have this handicap. And the more you cut out carbohydrates, the longer you do it for, the more insulin resistant you make yourself. And you may not even realize it because if you've cut all of your carbohydrates out, it looks like you have a really good fasted blood sugar level, right? So you take a blood test and it goes, oh, look, my, my blood sugar levels are really good. But this is like avoiding taking a test. You won't really know how well versed you are on a topic until you take the test. So in this case, taking the test for your insulin sensitivity is like eating carbohydrates. I've had a lot of people come to me, you know, after taking a keto, uh, after doing a keto diet or a carnivore diet, 
And when they decided that they were going to reintroduce carbohydrates back into their diet, they started gaining all the weight back. They started experiencing gas, bloating, constipation issues, things like this. And they say, well, you know, I miss eating, whether it be potatoes or beans or rice or fruit or whatever the case is. And now when I eat these things, I get all of these issues because they've wrecked their metabolism as a result. Insulin sensitivity is like a skill. It's an ability. And if you go for a long enough period of time without using that skill or that ability, you end up losing it. It's the same thing as muscle mass, right? If you don't use it, it gradually atrophies, goes away. If you learned, like, let's say, how to dance when you were a kid or you learned a foreign language, you were a kid, but you haven't used that skill or ability in, a, in several decades, it's, it's nearly impossible to go right back to it and pick up where you left off. You got to relearn it again. It's the same thing with your metabolism. That's why you don't want to shed yourself of one and prioritize the other. You want to be able to have a good glucose metabolism and a good fat metabolism. Ideally, you want both, right? So basically, um, to improve your insulin sensitivity, when I explain you have a carbohydrate dominant diet, you get your body to adapt while you reduce the amount of saturated fat because that has the most likelihood to be stored inside your liver and subcutaneously underneath your skin, etc. right? After all, insulin resistance largely is due to lipotoxicity, the overconsumption of dietary fat, specifically saturated fat, right? Polyunsaturated fat and monounsaturated fat sources don't really work the same way unless it's processed foods, right? Um, and that's kind of a different conversation, right? Talking about the molecular structure of these things. Uh, but yeah, so essentially where well, you have your dietary fat intake around uh, 20 to 10%, right? 15% is a good middle ground. 25% uh, is really pushing it and that should be where you cap off. But for the most part, uh, carbohydrate dominant, meaning at least 50% of your macros comes from carbohydrates and you can get up to 65 and even 80% of your macros coming from carbohydrates, right? To improve your fat metabolism though, that requires a blood sugar deficit, right? And a blood sugar deficit created without overloading your body with dietary fat. And so now this brings us to fasting some degree of fasting right now if fasting is very debilitating to you then this is really your your golden sign that your fat metabolism is shot and you more than likely uh have some form of adrenal fatigue right where your body isn't really releasing the adrenaline uh necessary in order to really dig into stored fat and use that uh, to replace uh, the energy that's declining. And so if you get into, let's say, a fast, and the deeper into the fast you get, your blood sugar goes from 100 to 90 to 80 to 70 to 60, and then you're in like a hypoglycemic state, right? Because that fat is not being used for energy. That's how you really know, oh, I got a fat metabolism problem, and this is why you're struggling to lose weight. So you may want to scale it back and, work and, and start with a more intermittent fasting strategy. If you don't really want to test this through fasting, your body will send you cues. So for example, if after three hours of not eating, you experience chronic fatigue, maybe lightheadedness, headache, fatigue, uh, maybe nausea, things like this, that can be a sign. If you do an intense workout where you burn through all of your uh, stored glycogen, all your stored uh, glucose, Right? You feel after that workout depleted, drained, nausea, lightheadedness, um, maybe dizziness, headache, that kind of thing. And you don't recover until you eat right? and you just pass out. That's a sign that like, yeah, your fat metabolism isn't working at all. Right? It's not switching gears there. And so this is where stress reduction becomes paramount. Right? So you can do the intermittent fasting strategy where you have a split. Okay, so I'm not talking about like re reducing carbohydrates or reducing fat or anything like that. But using your food in order to mineralize and replenish your body. And then using a fasting window in order to challenge your fat metabolism and chip away at it. Right. So intermittent fasting is really good for this. So let's say early time-restricted feeding, which is a form of intermittent fasting. 
And this is basically where you start eating like an hour after you wake up and then you finish eating about four to six or six to eight hours before bed. So for example, you can start eating at seven and then you finish eating at like 12, one or two o'clock or something like this. And then you fast for the rest of the day, right? And that, that fast for the rest of the day gives your body time to get deeper into a fasted state where your blood sugar levels drop, right? Now, again, if the fasting is really debilitating to you, you may want to stop eating at like 6 p.m. and then head to bed at like 9 or 10, right? And then as you get more used to it, then you can finish eating at 5 and then 4 and then, you know, 3 or 2, and you can start notching it up and opening up the fasting window, further challenging yourself. And you can do that over, you know, let's say a 12-week period or, or, or so, right? Or a 16-week period or so where you gradually are notching it back you know, either on a weekly or bi-weekly basis, getting deeper and deeper into uh, the fasting ability, right? Um, but the order of operations here is this, right? Because we need a good glucose metabolism and a good fat metabolism. We're not trying to lean all the way into one and, get, and detach ourselves from the other. We want to be able to improve both and maintain both. So stress reduction is paramount. So your diet has to be really on point when you eat, and then your sleep quality has to be on point when you sleep, right? And prioritizing stress reduction. And of course, that's a whole nother conversation, but this can be things like sound therapy, aromatherapy, um, even counseling, right? Working through your traumas, childhood traumas, things like this, right? Herbal teas loaded with antioxidants. Herbs and spices, pound for pound, are the most antioxidant-rich things uh, on the planet that you could possibly consume, right? And this is very important for reducing stress because stress basically is oxidative stress, right? The actual stress that breaks down your body on a cellular level, antioxidants, slows down and even to a degree prevents that process, right? So your herbal teas and spices and things like that, as well as good dietary choices loaded with antioxidants uh, is paramount there in combination with some form of fasting strategy. And the fasting strategy uh, should not come uh, at the expense of your well-being to the point where you're now incredibly stressed and debilitated, right? Because they can have a nasty uh, backlash effect. So you may have to gradually ease your way in. It's not going to be a rapid thing that happens really fast, but it's the thing that you do have to be patient with in order to really train your body. Because effectively, this really is a form of training. Hit the link in the description box below to book a call with me. And subscribe for more high raw vegan and chronic illness reversal tips.